Thank you again, praise team. And uh, please turn with us, if you will, in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I'm going to read this morning, beginning in verse 12. It says, Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, We'll have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. This is the reading of God's holy Inerrant word. A mother put some carrots on her daughter's plate one day, telling her that they would be good for her eyes and she'd be able to see in the dark if she would just eat these carrots. Well, the little girl took one look at the carrots and she began to push them back onto her mother's plate. And she said, well, mom, you eat them. I'll just use a flashlight. I think she figured, you know, if it was going to cost me something, I'll pass. Kind of the way that many times describes our relationship with Christ, right? If it's going to cost me something, I'll pass. If we could only realize that the gain of God's blessing is always going to be worth, always going to be worth the pain of the surrender that it takes to get there. Well, that's kind of the message that Jesus has for us this morning out of this passage of Scripture. You remember if you were with us last week that the disciples are back from their first solo ministry opportunity. And they report in all that they had done. In verse 10, they had semi-forgotten that the power belonged to Christ. That it wasn't what they had done, it was what Jesus had done through them. And so they needed a reminder. So Jesus sets up this test for, so it's called in John 6, in John's account of this, Jesus sets up this test to remind them, you need me. You need me. You thought you were doing this on your own? You need me. And so the disciples are here without food, without resource, They urge Jesus to send the crowd away. There's nothing that they can do to accommodate them. But Jesus tells them and challenges them there in verse 13 and says, well, you give them something. If you were here last week, you'll remember we said that the you is emphasized there in the original language. You give them something to eat. Of course, Jesus knows that they can't. It's impossible except through him. That's the point that he's trying to make. How often Jesus does this in the Bible, asks people to do impossible things except through him. So he takes little and makes much. Now he said we looked at this in two ways. First of all, we looked at what they did in order to see this great miracle of making much out of little. Last week we saw that they first of all recognized their own insufficiency. That's the starting point to have God's blessing in our life, to realize we really can't do anything without his help. Nothing of eternal value. They, secondly, they gave all that they had. And then thirdly, they obeyed his instructions even when it didn't really make any sense. It didn't seem right from a human perspective. It would, would not have made sense, and yet they obeyed. So that's what they did. But today we want to major on what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do in order to bring about this great multiplication in the lives 
of these disciples. Four things that we want to look at. First of all, he received what they had. He received what they had. When they offered it to him, he didn't say, well, thanks, you've done what I asked and offered it to you, so now here it is. No, no, he took it. He received it. It says in verse 16, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he took it all. You know, in one sense, you might think about this little boy. How did he feel? This is a little boy's, poor little boy's lunch, as we saw last week. It was plenty for him, except Jesus now takes the whole thing. He didn't just take one loaf and one fish and say, here, you can have the rest. He took it all. He took it all. Now, the first thing we should ask ourselves, did Jesus need more than one loaf and one fish in order to accomplish what he was about to do? Of course, the answer to that question is absolutely not. This miracle is an act of creation. Jesus' creative power is shown by one profoundly simple statement in John 1, verse 3, where it says that all things were made through him. Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, all tell us the same thing, remind us the creation was by God. You know, we have people arguing today about how did the whole thing start? Where did the universe come from? How did this all get underway in the first place? And those particularly of a scientific band who don't want to get outside the realm of science or try to propose ways, and there's absolutely no answer from a purely scientific point of view as to how things started. There's a big bang of some kind, but where did the material come from? What caused the bang? There is no answer to that question. And the answer that God did it seems too simple. And yet, Beloved, here's the thing I want you to see. I want you to see that God not only says in in, in Genesis 1-1, God created the heavens and the earth. He just makes a simple, flat-out statement that he did it. He proves that he can do it right here in time and in space and before people, eyewitnesses who saw Jesus creating something out of nothing. God hasn't left us without evidence of who he is and why he is and what he can do. This is an act of creation that Jesus does here. And he didn't need a lunch to start with. So what's the point of accepting this lunch? What's the point of taking this? Jesus certainly has a point, beloved, and the point is that there's a cost to having Jesus' power invade your life. There's a cost that attaches to have Jesus' blessing. It's not that Jesus needs it, it's that he requires it. It's not that Jesus needs us, but he requires us. He doesn't need our ability. He could make a thousand just like us in an instant, but he wants us. He wants us. He wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to be part with us. Do you see that? That's where he's going with all of this, and it will... Just like it cost him in order to be able to offer this, it will cost us in order to receive it. We have to give all, he will take all. Jesus doesn't do half measures. He doesn't multiply half a person. He doesn't give us the option to say, hey, listen, God, you can be involved in my family life. I'd love you to. We've got problems over here. We're dysfunctional. I'd like you to get involved in that. But my finances, you stay out of that. You can't do that. It doesn't work that way. God doesn't do half measures. He demands it all. He deserves it all. And he's not doing this, by the way, to be harsh or to be difficult. He does it for his glory and for our good. It's always that way. Turn with me. Let's see an example of this in the Old Testament. Turn to uh, Joshua 7. You got the uh, first five books, and then you get to Joshua, number six. So you get to Numbers and uh, Deuteronomy, and then Joshua. Joshua chapter seven. It's a familiar story. It's the story of how the Israelites, having come out of Egypt, been released from captivity there around 1450 B.C., arrive now after 40 years of wandering around in the in the wilderness because of disobedience. They arrive finally at Canaan at the Holy Land, where they were aiming for in the first place. And they have taken the city of Jericho. And you'll remember the strategy in Jericho really made a lot of military sense, right? They just marched around it for seven straight days. 
And then Jericho fell to them. So now they're ready to move on to the next city, which is called Ai. And this is going to be more conventional warfare that's going to go on here. And so let's start reading beginning in Joshua 7 and verse 3. Spies had come back to Joshua and they said this. They said, don't have all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So about 3,000 men went up there from the people and they fled before the men of Ai. So what happened? Looked like it was going to be easy, should be simple. The spy says, this is, you know, this is a piece of cake. Let's just take 3,000 guys and suddenly they're running back home. Look at verse 10. The Lord God said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their belongings. So what, Jesus, what God is saying here is someone's, someone's held back. Someone's kept for himself. So they do a search, tribe by tribe, family by family, and eventually they get down to this man, Achan. And so we read in verse 19, Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And they can answer, Joshua, truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I did when I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. Then I coveted them and took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. There are a lot of lessons in this passage, beloved. But one of them certainly is this. It doesn't pay to hold back. We may think that we can fool God, but we can't, of course. He sees it all. He knows exactly where we're holding back. He knows exactly what we're not giving. So the, the question we have this morning is, what are we holding back? What habit what secret compartment, you know, in our life that nobody else knows about? What are we holding back and saying, this is mine. I don't, God, God you can't have this. You know, to, to, to give it to the Lord is really, it, we, it, we'll see it by the end of this, is to get it back. The Lord says in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29, he says, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. God is not a halfway God. I, I know many of us think we can have a little God here and a lot of us there. It doesn't work that way. He deserves all that we are or could ever hope to be. Listen, Suppose, now if you're a guy, suppose you went out and proposed to this young lady, right? And, and she seems excited. You think she loves you. And so you propose and she says, well, yeah, I, I, this is wonderful. I'll marry you and I'll give you one week a month and you can have the whole month of May. I'll be yours those times. The rest of the time, I'm, you know, that's mine. How would you feel? Would you marry that girl? I don't think so. That's not the kind of deal that we're looking for in a covenant relationship. And beloved, why do we think God would be looking for less? God's looking for, for it all. It can't be, Lord, I'll give you Sundays, and in fact, I'll even put a little in the offering, and you know, hey, I'll put something in the building fund. But the rest of the week is mine, hands off. The language I use at work is mine. The way I treat my neighbors who are unfair to me is mine. There are certain things that are just mine. This habit I have is mine. How can God work with that? God says, I want it all. 
He wants it all. And once he's got it all from the disciples, look what he did. Beloved, he'll do the same with us. But first of all, he's got to have it all. He'll take it all. Second thing that I see here is, well, we're back in, probably got to get back in Luke 9 first, right? In Luke 9, the second thing we see in this passage is that Jesus blessed what they had given him. He blessed what they had given him. Look at verse 16. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and he said a blessing over them. So we kind of, you know, we kind of read over that and we say, well, okay, so Jesus prayed over the meal for, you know, we do that. So Jesus did that. He prayed over the meal. But the word blessing here is a little more than just that. It carries two, what I would call complementary but nuanced meanings. And we kind of need to get both of those in mind. Now, the word blessing is used, remember I told you last week, this This miracle is found in all four Gospels, one of two that are found that way, the resurrection being the other one. In the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the word blessing is what's used. But in John, in John chapter 6, where he talks about this, John 6 verse 11, it reads a little differently. Don't necessarily need to turn there, but let me read this. It says, Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, when he had given thanks. I love that. I, I, I love it for two reasons. First of all, if you think about it, was Jesus giving thanks because he needed the disciples and their food? Was that the issue? I don't think so. So was he giving thanks because the two loaves, or the five loaves and the two fish were gonna be plenty to go around to that crowd of 5,000 men plus whatever women and children? Couldn't have been that, right? So why is he giving thanks? Because he values the gift, beloved, whatever it is. And he gives thanks even though it's not nearly enough. He wants to take our little and make it much. And I think when it says that Jesus gave thanks for this, you know, little five loaves and two fish, man, it gives us incredible visibility into the heart of God. You know, the next time you think you're insignificant in the eyes of God, you may be insignificant in the rest of the world, I don't know, but in the eyes of God, if you think you're insignificant, think again about Jesus giving thanks for five loaves and two fish. That's crazy from a human standpoint, but he gave thanks because he was thankful for the little and he's thankful for you. He's thankful for you, he is. Jesus is thankful for us. A little, you know, a young lady, middle school age, she came home from school one day. Some of you have probably seen this scene play out of your home. She threw herself on the couch, wallowing in self-pity. She said to her mother and her brother who happened to be there, she said, nobody, nobody loves me. The whole world hates me. Apparently it been a bad hair day or something, right? Her brother just, you know, he piped up and he said, well, Sally, he said, he said you can't say that. He said, he said, that's not true. He said, some people don't even know you. How could they hate you? That's an encouraging word, isn't it? Some people don't even know you, so everybody can't hate you. But listen, beloved, I want you to, you, you got to wrap your arms around this. There's one person who treasures you. That's the person of Jesus Christ. He loves you. He loves you like no one else will ever love you. He cares about you as no one else will ever care about you. It's not because he needs you. It's because he chooses to love you. I think it's a hard thing for us to really grasp how Jesus loves us. And because he loves us, if we, what we give to him, he will never diminish us. He will only multiply us. But we have to give it to him. We have to give ourselves to him. We have to enter this relationship with all of our commitment, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. That's the way the Bible puts it. It doesn't mean that it's perfectly done. None of us can do that perfectly. But it means in our heart of hearts, we're giving all that we are. God loves us whether we do that or not, beloved. But imagine what he can do with us when we do that. 
Now, the other nuance is also very important of this word blessed, this word blessed. What does it mean that he blessed it? Blessed translates the Greek word eulageo. Sound familiar? It's the word from which we get our English word eulogy, right? Eulogy. What is what does that mean? What, what, what does it mean when we eulogize something? Well, it means when we eulogize someone, we speak highly of them, right? We praise them. We lift them up. That's the root meaning here. So you think about that. Jesus is taking these five loaves and these two fish that he has, and he's eulogizing them. He's speaking highly of them to heaven, to the Father. Five loaves and two fish are being eulogized by Jesus here. Now, I think that's an amazing picture. Think about this. If you had to feed 10,000 people, 12,000 people, would you be eulogizing five loaves and two fish? I don't think so. If you're like me, you'd be saying, well, where's the rest of it, right? We don't eulogize small things, and we miss tremendous blessing because we don't. See, Jesus eulogized these. He thought highly of this. He's, he's extolling little. Five loaves and two fish. Because he treasures what he's been given. He treasures what is available. He takes advantage of it and he speaks highly of it and, he, and in the process, guess what happens? That which is unworthy becomes worthy. That which is too little becomes too much. That which is insufficient becomes more than enough. Is that amazing? But that's what God does. He like, you know, what does he tell us in 1 Corinthians? I love to use people that are, you know, kind of the world looks down on them. They're not the smartest. They're not the best. They're not the brightest. They're not the, most, the, the richest. They're not anything. But I love to use them. Why? So that the glory goes to me. So that in the end, it's clear who did this. That's why we should join his heart in eulogizing, in thinking highly of small things. You know, I, how do you get practical on this? I, you know, I don't know. In your life, some of you may think that your, you know, I don't know, your current car isn't enough, right? It's, it's not enough. Some of you may think your spouse isn't enough. This isn't what I expect. It's not what I thought I was getting. Some of you who are sitting here this morning may think that your, that, that, that your home is not enough. So let me ask you, when was the last time you eulogized it? When was the last time you thanked God for what you have so that he could have the opportunity to make whatever change may be required? God wants us to appreciate and to enjoy and to consider worthy what it is that he's already given us so that he can give us more, so that he can trust us with more. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's eulogizing these five loaves and two fish. I mean, you, you can't get this kind of deal anywhere else in the world I mean, you and I are worth a million times more in the hands of God than we ever would be outside of him, right? He can multiply little. He can take little and appreciate it and multiply it and he turns little into much and he turns ordinary into great. God does that. There's a great adventure waiting out there when we begin to operate by the principles of God. You, you know, we got, we got an opportunity to practice this now as we begin to see, you know, week by week and month by month, a little bit of money coming into the building fund. We're all going to look at that and say, whoa, that's coming in slow. We're never going to get there. We're never going to get the money we want. Listen, if God wants that building over there, we need to be thanking him and eulogizing whatever is there. Do you see that? That's where God wants our heart to be so that he can multiply whatever in whatever way it takes by making more money available, by making a cheaper building available, whatever. I thoroughly, I, I don't know about you, I'm looking forward to this adventure just to see how God multiplies. But we get an opportunity to do this. This principle of, this principle of multiplication and blessing is found throughout the Bible. I mean, I, we, don't, we don't put enough emphasis on this. We don't see this, but listen to this. Genesis 1.22 
to Adam and Eve. God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and what? Multiply and fill the earth. Blessing and multiplication. He says in Genesis 9-1, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He says in Genesis 22, 17, I will surely bless you to Abraham. I will bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. Now listen, this is not what the prosperity gospel guys say, that you get everything you want in this life because it's never about this life. The Bible even tells us in Hebrews 11, Abraham was given this wonderful promise, but he says he was looking forward to the city that was on high. He's looking forward to heaven. He understood where the real blessing is, but the point is God will multiply us in whatever way is right at whatever time is right if we're, if we're giving ourselves to him. The blessing and the multiplication come. He told, he told the Israelites in Deuteronomy 7.13 through Moses, he will love you, bless you, and multiply you. Are you seeing a trend? Fourteen times in the Bible we find the words bless and multiply in the same verse. There's a principle. Let me show you an example of this. It's in Judges, so we're back in the Old Testament again. Judges. If you were in Samuel, go to Judges chapter 6. Judges 6. This is a familiar story. This is the story of Gideon. But there's a really interesting verse when God calls young Gideon. Judges 6 and verse 13. What the, yeah, the background here is, of course, Israel is in captivity, the Midianites, and they are, they are about to be overwhelmed by them as they go through various cycles of this with various people throughout the book of Judges. And here it's the Midianites, a local tribe that is about to overrun them. And so God calls Gideon, and it says in verse 13 of Judges 6, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. <laughs> This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. There, there's more than one reason, both for its humor and for its message. But first thing to understand is that the, the term angel of the Lord is used in the Old Testament on numerous occasions. Most theologians believe that the, that, that, that the term is used as a reference to a pre-incarnate, meaning before he was born in Bethlehem, pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. That this is the second person of the Godhead. This is more than just an angel the word angel literally means messenger. This is, this is the, an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament times. The Son of God has come. So if this is Jesus, he's saying to Gideon, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. That's where the humor is. Jesus calls him mighty man of valor. Is he? I mean, not by any stretch of the imagination is Gideon at this point a mighty man of valor. He's a timid young farmer. What he is is he's five loaves and two fish. You look at verse 15. It says, Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. If you read on, you'll find out he's scared to death of the Midianites. He's scared of responsibility. He's scared and frightened of his own countrymen, and he's scared of his own Family, so much so that he goes out and, and does a sacrifice at night because he didn't want anybody to know what's going on. Mighty man of valor? So why does God call him that? Why does Jesus show up on the scene and say to Gideon, oh, mighty man of valor? Why? Here's why, beloved, because Jesus sees what Gideon is going to be. Not what he is, but what he's going to be when the blessing of God has truly fallen on him. And if you look further, you'll see in verse 15, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you. 
I remember a little book uh, that I read when I was a kid. I don't even remember who the hero was, but it was a series of books about a, some little boy. And one of the books was called God Plus One is a Majority. That's a good thing to remember. So when the Lord says to Gideon, but I will be with you, that's the blessing. Do you see? That's God's blessing. And then what happens? And you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And you'll recall that God sent Gideon out to one of the greatest military victories in the history of the world. With 300 men, he defeated tens of thousands of Midianites. The reason most of us don't experience that power in our lives is because we're holding back. We fear. We rebel. We compromise, we accommodate, we make excuses, we hold back. And the blessing of God can't really reside on us because we're just playing at Christianity. We renege on promises we've already made, perhaps. When the, when the going gets tough, you don't find us there. We're looking for a way out. Our affluence, I'll tell you what the greatest enemy of Christianity is in America, it's our affluence. Our affluence grabs us by the neck and we're afraid we're going to lose something that God gave us in the first place. God will bless us, beloved, but we have to give him the whole lot. Can't hold back. Can't be part way. God wants his blessing to reside on us. But we have to give him all. Third thing that Jesus did, we kind of like the blessing part. We're probably not going to be so crazy about the next one. Look at it. He broke what they had. Look at verse 16. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves. And that's what he gave the disciples to set before the crowd. He broke the loaves. Why didn't he just duplicate them? These weren't like huge loaves, you know, where you needed to cut in half because one was too big. These were little barley loaves that would have been about, just about, well, the little boy in his lunch had two of them. So that tells you, what does that tell you? Or five of them, five loaves and two fish. He had five of these. That's what he was going to eat. They're just little rolls. So why does the Lord break them? Here's why. He breaks them to symbolize what he has to do with what we give him. He's symbolizing what he has to do with what we give him in order to make it of great value, in order to multiply it. We come with very rough edges, don't we? Some rougher than others, but all of us very rough. That's why Paul says in Philippians 1 verse 6, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion or perfection at the day of Jesus Christ. That's great to know, isn't it? I can remember as a young man finding that verse, clinging to it, thinking this is great, God's going to perfect me. And I really had no concept. I hadn't really studied the Bible enough to realize I just thought, well, okay, this is great. So God saved me. I gave my heart to him. I gave my life to him. And God's going to just, you know, he's gradually he's just going to perfect me as I go along. It's going to be wonderful. And at the day of Christ, I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be perfect. But in the meantime, it's kind of a, you know, smooth edge. I didn't, what I didn't realize is, you know what the tool for perfection is? It's adversity. The tool that God uses to perfect us is Adversity. It's not like he just magic weighs this magic wand and we just get better as we go along. He brings adversity into our life to teach us lesson after lesson after lesson. Listen, adversity is not adversity is not the exception in the Christian life, beloved. It's the norm. It's the norm. It's what's normal. If you're not, 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 certainly there are periods of time when things go well, and that's great, but adversity is the norm in the Christian life. If you're going along and there's nothing happening and there hasn't been for years, you, you should ask yourself, what's happening here? Just like a, just like a cowboy has to break the horse, right? <clears throat> and, 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 he, and he does this through adversity. So our, God is shaping us. The only, difference is, the only difference is that the process of shaping us takes a lifetime. It's... It just goes on and on. 
the whole time that we're here in this life, but God is gradually perfecting us and bringing us to perfection. Many verses you could look at. Philippians 1.29. God not only gave us the gift of salvation, he gave us the gift of suffering. Why? So he could perfect us. They're both gifts of God. This is why the message of the prosperity gospel preachers is so devastating. It teaches people, it teaches people that the Christian life is easy, that it's about comfort and ease and affluence and pain-free, and the Bible is teaching exactly the opposite. You say, well, I I thought it was all about joy. It is about joy, beloved. It's about joy in adversity, not about joy in the absence of adversity. How we miss this. God has planned it that way. Think of it this way. Even, even, our, even our example to the world requires this. You know, when, when we're, we, we kind of think, hey, the great testimony is when I can say, hey, Jesus gave me, gave me affluence, he gave me money, he gave me position, he gave me prosperity, he gave me joy, he gave me family, he gave me a great house, everything's great, and, and Jesus is the one, and the world is saying, well, that's wonderful for you. That's your, so Jesus is your ticket to prosperity. I got mine over here. I work hard. But you show them joy in the middle of adversity, they don't know how to do that. That's where your Christian testimony really makes sense. Do you see? And I'm not saying go out and look for suffering. You won't have to look for us. It'll find you. The question is, what will you do with it? Will you realize that this is God shaping me? I love the story Charles Swindoll used to t- tell this. He, was, he overlapped with us in Southern California for a long time and used to hear him every once in a while. He told the story one time of a businessman who was many years rejecting Christ. He, just, he knew the gospel. He knew about Christ, but he kept... He just said, no, I'm, I, I can't give in. He knew what it would cost. He knew there would be a cost if he did this, and he didn't, he didn't want anything to do with that. He wanted to control his own life. He wanted it to be him, and so he rejected. But the day finally came when he said, you know what, I've, I've gone down this road as long as I can. I, 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 I want to give my life to Christ. I realize I need to do that. And so he did. He, he committed his life unequivocally to Christ. That very night, he got a phone call said, your business is burning up. You better come down. And so he went down just in time to see the warehouse that he had for the goods that he produced going up in flames. The irony of it kind of hit him. You know, he had a little smile on his face, and one of his colleagues walked up to him and said, Don, what, what gives? You're smiling about this? Your whole life is going up in flames? What is it about? And he, and, he, and he looked at his friend, and he said, I know, Fred, I know what's going on. He said, but I was just thinking. He said, it was just this morning that I gave, this, I gave my whole life, including this business, to God. It's God's business. If God chooses to burn it up, I guess that's his privilege. You say, that's really strange theology. No, it's not. That's biblical theology. That was a man who was being broken so that God could multiply him in ways that he would never have imagined. Why could God trust Joseph to become the number two guy in Egypt, which was the world's superpower at the time. Why? Because he could trust him at the bottom of a well where he put him into adversity to shape him because he could trust him in the licentious household of Potiphar's wife because he could trust him in the hellhole of an Egyptian prison. He wouldn't lose his faith. He kept trusting God. And so because God could trust him anywhere, he Eventually put him as number two in Egypt. Now, it doesn't mean that God's going to make every one of us number two in Egypt. That's not the point. But the point is God will shape us because he can trust us. So the question is, where are we holding back? Where are we harboring grudges? What is it that isn't his? Whatever adversity is in your life, it's just God shaping you. It's God breaking you. It's God preparing to use you in even greater ways. Look forward to the adventure. Watch him multiply you. Fourth and last thing that I see here that Jesus did is he returned. He returned. But he didn't return what they gave him. He returned what he had made of what they gave him. And that was wonderful. If he just returned what they gave him, they'd have been no better off than where they started, right? 
But he returned what he made of it. Turn on your imagination for a minute. Here's Jesus praying over these loaves of bread and these, and these fish, and then he begins to break them. <clears throat> and he takes a basket full, fills up a basket, and he gives it to Peter, and he says, you know, go give that to somebody. And then he breaks another basket full, and he gives it to John, and he says, go take that to somebody. 5,000 times or more. Jesus did that. What's he teaching them? He's teaching them sufficiency. He's teaching them that the sufficiency isn't in them, it's in him. And as he breaks this that they have given him and gives it back to them, the food just keeps on coming. There's way more than enough. God is sufficient for whatever the need. I don't know what the need is in your life. But I know this, I know God is sufficient for it. Just need to trust him. Need to put it into his hands, let him break it, let him create out of nothing, ex nihilo. Here comes the food, it just keeps on coming. Twelve baskets full left over, it tells us. I, I, you know, had the disciples already eaten or was each one of those baskets one for them? I, I don't know, but twelve baskets full were left. Reminds me of what Paul said in Ephesians 3.20 when he says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. You ever seen God do more than you ever asked? I've seen that so many times. So what are we withholding from God? He will never diminish us. He will only multiply us as we give ourselves to him. Listen, beloved, this is the only way you can become sufficient for what you were made for. There's a purpose for your creation. There's a purpose for your life. There's a mission to be accomplished. And the only way it can be done is by giving ourselves to Christ. That's the only way we can become what we were made to be. So whether it's giving him the habit that we're hanging on to or giving him the time that we think that we don't have or giving him the money that we think we need to have or giving him our family, our career, our secret ambitions, whatever it is, belongs to him. He'll multiply it. He'll never diminish you. Think of the story that Abraham Lincoln used to tell a lot about the Kentuckian who enlisted during the War of 1812. He was about to march off to war. His sweetheart, as was kind of common in those days, she made him a bullet pouch. And on the bullet pouch, you know, she was going to inscribe the words victory or death. And he looked at her and he said, sweetheart, you know, could, could, doesn't that seem a little strong? Suppose you just put on there victory or get wounded. You know, something. Something other than death. Let's go halfway on this. God doesn't do halfway. What does he say in Luke 9? We're going to get there very shortly, 23. If any man wants to follow me, let him take up his cross or her cross daily. Deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. That's what it takes, beloved. Death self, life to Christ. But what we get back, amazingly better. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this challenge. We thank you for the, well, Lord, so many things we see in this passage, we see your, your greatness, we see your omnipotence being demonstrated in the, in the very provision of bread and fish out of nothing, really. Yeah, you started with a couple, but the only way that could have been multiplied the way it was there is to create out of nothing. So there's God at work right in the midst of these people. And Lord, this same God, you, you, you who are the rock of ages means you just weren't the rock back there. You're the same rock that's available to us today. Jesus Christ, as it tells us in Hebrews, the same yesterday, today, and forever. You'd like to take us and you'd like to multiply us. Help us to give ourselves to you. Help us to, Lord, help us to do, help, you know, as we sing this song, help us not to sing it to our, you know, to our condemnation. Have thine own way. Help us to sing it as a true reflection of a heart. That while, we, while our actions may be imperfect, our heart is truly reaching out to you. May it be true, I pray, for the sake of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.